You are now tuned into the Hip Hop Learners Podcast, a place for conversations on hip hop literature, both scholarly as well as general audiences. Today's guest is Michael McGuire. Michael has been a prominent figure in the quest to document Maritime's hip hop history. In 2011, he published a master's dissertation on the history of Halifax hip hop called How the East Coast Rocks A History of Hip Hop in Halifax from 1985 to 1998. Additionally, he teaches at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax and has put considerable efforts into building an archive for Maritime's hip-hop history to be held and preserved. This conversation addresses both works and bridges in nicely with last week's conversation with Mark B. Campbell and his challenges building the Northside Hip-Hop Archive on Canadian hip-hop more broadly. Lastly, McGuire is currently working on hip-hop pedagogy and hip-hop as an educational tool and has some unique and creative ideas regarding this field that I feel like are worthy of discussion. Please welcome to the show, Michael McGuire. You have um, kind of an interesting perspective covering covering hip-hop from a lot of people, um, being the fact that not only do you come from an artist's perspective, but the approach that you've taken to kind of discuss hip hop has been very much localized and from your own community as well. Um, can we kind of, I want to speak about that to some degree, um, your research, particularly in the thesis that I really want to end up talking about for the majority of this conversation focuses on Halifax from kind of the early eighties and mid eighties, right up until about like 97, 98 or so. Um, being the fact that you are a, an artist in Halifax what era did you end up kind of participating in mostly? Um, is that the, the era that you kind of started in and developing from, or did you end up coming a little bit later? I came in as a practitioner a little bit later. Um, I started as a fan in junior high school. So that would have been uh, early nineties, right around the time that local Dre was coming out and uh, the Halltown compilations, uh, hip club groove, that sort of stuff. So these were things I was picking up, you know, at the local Sam, the record man, strictly as a fan. Um, I loved rap music. I would buy anything I could get my hands on. And then I started seeing locally made stuff and that was just exciting. So I started getting into that again, more so just on, on a fan tip. And it wasn't until later about uh, 2002, 2003 that I started actively, uh, you know, going out and, and getting on stages and trying to do it myself. But uh, so it was a few years before I actually decided to take the plunge. But I, I think that was important, too, because you kind of have to start as a fan in order to in order to make it good, I think. Yeah, fair enough. Um, at what point do you start kind of diving into academ uh, academia a little bit more seriously um, in terms of I, I'm not sure what your undergrad studies were like and what you ended up working on for any kind of thesis or project for that. Um, but at the very least, in terms of the, the master's project and the thesis that you ended up uh, compiling for that, when did that kind of start taking shape? Well, that all took kind of a weird route, which I could say about everything I've done because um, none of it was, you know, following a, a prescribed path or anything. Yeah. Um, I started out in, in like 2003, uh, rapping a year later, I hooked up with EMC uh, from Second Front, later from uh, Three Sheet. And he and I started rhyming together, but he had done a degree in international development studies. And so he had all these connections asking him to do workshops and seminars and, hey, can you come speak about, Oxfam or, or some other NGO uh, and, you know, put a little bit of rhyming and beatboxing into it to make it interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he asked me to start doing that stuff with him, which I had never done, but I liked writing political rhymes. I liked kind of social justice themes. So it felt like a decent fit. We did that together for about a year. And then Jeff Chang's Can't Stop, Won't Stop came out. Uh, I read that and I was Oh, it's fantastic. And it was really kind of the first academically credible uh, history, which, you know, you could make the argument that like rap records from KRS and Public Enemy were academically weighty. But, you know, this is the first time that a book really with footnotes and, and detailed descriptions, you know, laid out a version of the story. And so I took that to Eric and said, well, look, why don't we put together a workshop that focuses on the history and, and how that matches with social justice. And so we did that and then that worked for a couple of years. So during that time, I was an undergrad doing a history degree, um, 
which wasn't really connected to hip hop at all. But at the same time, when I wasn't sitting in a classroom, I was either making records with Eric, uh, that'd be EMC, or doing these workshops on hip hop, on hip hop culture, rhyme writing, beatboxing, freestyling, kind of all different aspects of, you know, being a hip hop practitioner. So then once I finished school, uh, finished my undergrad, rather, I'd been doing this kind of workshop seminar, you know, giving talks kind of thing for a couple of years. And that put the seed in my head. So I lied through my teeth to get into grad school. <laughs> I told them I was going to like, I'm going to study the uh, creation of Nova Scotian identity through uh, tourism initiatives in the 1960s. And they said, oh, that sounds, you know, very good. You, you know, of course, I'm going to do that. And as soon as I got in and, and met with an advisor, I said, I'm not doing that. I want to write about hip hop. Um, I want to write about local hip hop specifically. And it took a lot of convincing. But yeah. eventually we were able to hammer out a way of actually doing that, that it would work. And uh, again, part of that reason for doing it was that nobody had else, nobody had done it. There was a lot of talk about it. Uh, the Hall of Famous message board was certainly, you know, regularly had posts about various bits of Halifax hip hop history. It was all stuff people talked about, but nobody had ever formalized it. So I figured this is an opportunity. Uh, I got myself in the door here. I have pulled the wool over their eyes. and They're going to let me do something. Why don't I do this and commit this to the record as best I can? How well did you end up understanding the scene before kind of materializing your, your thesis and doing the research. Um, one of the things that kind of surprised me is I I understood Halifax to be somewhat important just from a hip-hop fan's perspective. And I, I originally didn't grow up here. I'm in Nova Scotia now. I've lived here since 2011 in Cape Breton. Um, however, I grew up in Ontario, and the majority of my, um, I guess, initial exposure to to hip hop would have ended up being in Ontario. And even after I moved here, I didn't necessarily have that sense of local pride that someone that was originally from Nova Scotia would have. But one of the things that I did know is that artists like um, the Sebutones, for example, and really maybe only the Sebutones, um, because Classified I very much, uh, I, I was aware of, but I took Classified to be kind of East Coast Maritimes hip hop, whereas Sebutones, I really felt kind of transcended that into something that was more credibly kind of recognized worldwide. Um, I was a fan of the Anticon movement and Dose One and Alias and Soul and it, again, Rhyme Sayers and Def Jux and kind of that underground hip hop scene. And the fact that Halifax had the Sebutones with 6-2 and Buck 65 meant that there was something there, but I didn't really understand the the weight of the scene. Being the fact that you kind of grew up as a fan, at the very least, in the early 90s in Halifax, or at least within kind of that community to some degree, did you understand the, I guess, the, the weight of the scene just from a fan's perspective or participating in it? Or did that come a little bit later once you started putting the pieces of the puzzle together? Because once I read your thesis, it was really much like holy shit, this is, this is a much more in-depth scene than I ever knew, and it's a much more fundamentally important scene than I ever knew. Yeah. Um, I don't think I knew right away. Uh, you know, when my first exposure to local hip-hop was MCJ and Cool G getting played at the, the Youth World Dance that I used to go to on Friday nights. Gotcha. Um, and even though you, you recognize that, okay, the video was shot in Uniac Square, uh, they were still kind of billed as being from Montreal because that's where they you know, had to go to do their major label stuff. Yeah. So I knew that there were people kind of making moves and doing things, but I really didn't have any idea of the scale of it until much later. Um, one of the things that really kind of moved me to get involved in the scene was I was living in San Jose, California uh, in around 2000, 2001. And I was in a, a record store somewhere in the Bay Area, and they had, uh, I think it was Man Overboard was about to come out, um, Buck 65 on Anticon. Yeah. And Anticon had connections in Oakland and the Bay Area, so this, and I, I recognized the name. I was like, oh, that's the guy from Halifax. Yeah. And his stuff has made it here, and it was like a little, you know, was, I think it was handmade, you know, just a little tiny cardboard thing with a couple of CDs in it. 
I thought, oh, well, that's really cool. You know, it made it all the way to San Francisco. That's, I'll check that out. So I checked that out and, and that really kind of brought me back into uh, digging into the local stuff. Once I started to do that, I, I started to see it in kind of an evolving sense. Uh, right around the time that I got, you know, really into, involved in terms of performing and, and doing workshops and stuff was right around the time that Buck signs his major label deal with Warner. Uh, so he's making moves and, and he famously negotiated uh, that they would put him up in Paris for a year while he made his new record. And so I was like, oh, okay, you know, people are making moves and people are starting to do things. But it was, again, just little things like that, that over time made me realize this is much bigger than uh, just a small scene. And again, it's, it, it's hard to really recognize all at once, but you start to see it come together with, uh, folks like Scratch Bastard going out and like taking down Scribble Jam titles. Uh, you've got folks like Pat Stay going out and and starting a battle career here, but then moving out into King of the Dot and stuff. Uh, so you start to see kind of individuals move out and do bigger things that are drawing a lot of attention to the scene. And I think the thing that really made me realize this, you know, kind of the global appeal of Halifax stuff was meeting a girl who had moved to Halifax from Japan strictly on the strength of liking Buck 65 and 62 and Josh Martinez. Uh, you know, she was looking for a place to go to, you know, after she finished university to start her life. And she liked Halifax rap, which I'm assuming she encountered because of Anticon's involvement in their distribution networks. But yeah, like that stuff reached to Japan and somebody came here because they were a fan of that. And, and I think that's the moment when I really realized, you know, this is really something special. Yeah. I don't know if Scranton, Pennsylvania has that, you know, I'm sure there's rappers in Scranton. Are they getting out like that? Or, you know, are, I don't know why I picked Scranton, but you know, <laughs> there's all kinds of smaller scenes that are kind of comparable size wise to Halifax, but they, I don't know that they've done the same kinds of things. So it was kind of a, a slow rolling revelation. But uh, yeah, I, I realized as I was getting into this, that, yeah, this is a much bigger story. Uh, and I think that's also partly why it needed to be told. Yeah, you mentioned in terms of some of your incentives that one of the incentives was the fact that the history really hadn't been told prior. Um, were you aware of, at least not in, I guess, any sort of... Um, really kind of dense or cohesive way. Were you aware of any of the more kind of surface level narratives that have been drawn up regarding the Halifax scene? Let that be individual articles or in the thesis, you end up mentioning the, um, what was it? The, the work of Chamberlain um, and his writings and some of the inaccuracies that he ended up writing um, or I guess kind of laying to stone. Were you aware of, yeah. of those writings or, or no? <laughs> Um, I, well, I was. And once I started getting into, you know, the master's program and thinking about, OK, how am I going to tackle this this subject? I, I did it in two ways. One was to take in as much uh, literature about hip hop studies as possible. So Trisha Rose, Jeff Chang, uh, Murray Foreman, you know, as much as I could get in. Yeah. So I had kind of a, a theoretical basis. Yeah, you're kidding. At the very least. To, oh, fantastic. And then it was looking at, you know, what does exist in terms of uh, chronicling the local scene. And that was really sparse. Uh, a few articles in the coast. Uh, there's a very well-known uh, source article from, I think, 2003. Um, maybe it was 2004. But uh, that kind of detailed some things. Uh, Vice, in their early days, covered Halifax Hip Hop a bit. Uh, but that was fairly agenda driven too, and not necessarily a, a, a unbiased source. Uh, and then, you know, the odd bits of journalism that would pop up every once in a while where somebody would try to tell the story of Halifax hip hop. Um, and one of the beauties of that was being on Halifamous, which was this message board that was widely used by a lot of folks in the scene. So when something came out that wasn't accurate, it was absolutely eviscerated by the users on the board. Yeah. Uh, so you'd have folks like Joe Run and Jesse Dangerously stepping in and saying, well, wait a second, this is inaccurate. So I had a good sense of what some of the prevailing narratives were, but also that there was a lot of issues with that. And I realized, 
I don't think anybody's ever written anything about Halifax hip hop that hasn't been contentious, uh, that hasn't sort of misrepresented things. And that's both curious and should be corrected. So, and I mean, one of the most curious things about it, one of the, the only things actually written about the scene, um, I think it was Chamberlain. Yeah. Uh, the global, what is it? Global noise. I think was the name of the book. I'm not sure. And, exactly. uh, and Global Noise was this book. It had a section on Canada, and they looked at uh, the scenes in, I think, either Toronto or Vancouver, one or the other, uh, Quebec, because it was kind of unique for the Francophone stuff, sure. and Halifax, because it was kind of this outlier in the, uh, you know, hip-hop backwater where there was still some interesting things going on. But even reading through that, it mentioned a lot of names, but a lot of those names were you know, people who were kind of transitory in the scene weren't really around for a while. And uh, they got their name in it because they were doing something, in, you know, that week. Uh, or there was a couple names in there that I still can't figure out who these people were. <laughs> so it, it, it makes reference to a couple of rap groups. And, and I've asked around, I've asked everybody, have you ever heard of who these people are? Nope. Nobody's ever heard of them. So, <laughs> So they, there was this thing, but it was fraught with inaccuracy. So I'm like, sure. well, somebody with the inside scoop needs to step up uh, and tell this story. And folks had, I mean, I, I really got to give a lot of credit to like Joe Run for posting, uh, you know, historical threads on Hall of Famous and later on Facebook and things. Uh, but those little seeds, you know, he would tell a story and then other people would jump in and, and add on to it. Um, it was that sort of stuff that made me want to do it. Like those stories need to be preserved in some way other than uh, this message board, which now is completely inaccessible. Yeah. Yeah. We've briefly had the conversation in terms of sources um, previously before, but um, I guess one of my, one of the big takeaways when I was rereading the thesis in preparation for, for this conversation that we're having now um, was just how, well the the narrative was able to be uh, was able to be constructed given the fact that your sources were relying strictly on primary sources with no oral history interviews being done other than maybe a few kind of email chains back and forth with different people um i think you had spoken to a, a couple people through email chains um Jay Lapointe, I think at one point uh, was mentioned as a as an email source, um, but for the most part, it was through flyers, liner notes, um, random articles that you would end up getting from from Vice, some of the other things that you had ended up already citing, um, live recordings, and then the recordings themselves, and they were pieced together in order to build this narrative. Um, I'm working within Canadian hip hop as well, and I. Uh, I've already written the Saskatoon chapter. I'm pretty much wrapped up the Vancouver chapter, which includes Van uh, Vancouver Island. And building these narratives, I found almost entirely relies on my use of oral history interviews. Of course, that's the approach that I chose to end up going with, but I would have a very hard time being able to, to build those narratives without the use of them. Um, and oftentimes, certain people you're not able to speak to for whatever reason, either they passed away or they're just inaccessible, they've declined an interview, whatever it ends up being. And trying to tell those stories without actually speaking to them um, proves like incredibly difficult. The fact that you were able to build this narrative without the use of that is is amazing. Can you kind of speak on some of your... I guess, choices in, in terms of um, your sources and how you ended up kind of putting this thing together? Sure. Well, I mean, that was kind of a choice that I, I settled on, but was also out of necessity. Uh, when I started trying to do the, the thesis and trying to convince, you know, the academy that there was something here that I could, you know, do and it had validity and it had weight and it was something real. Um, there was initially a lot of pushback against that. They didn't know how somebody could interpret rap or how they could research it or how they could deal with it. Um, I, I had to do an ethics review and they said, you know, here's how you handle witnessing a murder or a drug deal. And I was just so floored by that. Like, <laughs> this is, you know, it's racist. Like, what is this? And I thought, I want to do this in a way where I'm not going to have to kind of bend the knee to uh, ethics boards and things who 
don't understand the culture and don't get what I'm trying to do and will impose a lot of restrictions based on their own lack of understanding. Yeah. So part of my primary source, you know, methodology was just to get around uh, dealing with some of that academic red tape. The other side of it was that a lot of these things are very much kind of a he said, she said scenario. Um, you're talking about people's artistic careers. So you're talking about alter egos. You're talking sure. about, uh, you know, very performative uh, expressions of things. And especially if it's hip hop and, you know, somebody gets dissed or somebody gets offended or somebody loses the battle, uh, you have a lot of different perspectives on that that sometimes conflict and it can be hard to get the real story. So that was the other consideration too, is, uh, I don't want to just have a bunch of conflicting information where nobody agrees on what happened. So maybe there's a way, if I know what some of these stories are up front, uh, if I'm familiar with some of the, the basic loose framework narratives, uh, then what can I find that speaks to that? Yeah. Uh, so I know, you know, in 95 ish, there's a split in the scene. Uh, and I know, kind of who the players were on either side. So where can I find that in the text? Where can I find that on record or uh, in interviews that were done? And it's all there. And, and that's the thing. I, I kind of knew what I was looking for and was able to find things that supported that or debunked it in other cases. Um, but I, I kind of knew uh, the general sense of what I'm looking for and was able to find information that spoke to that. So um, it was really just kind of a, a patchwork thing that fortunately came together. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think the type of narrative that you end up building um, and what the narrative actually ends up being, I think is different than what it would end up um, being produced if it was through oral history interviews. You mentioned in terms of the split that occurred kind of in the mid-90s. Um, that's a thing that you start to see in different scenes, right? Um, it's generally separated by different terms. Um, so in your thesis, it's uh, the idea of race comes into play and the idea of kind of authenticity comes into play. Um, whereas, say, in Victoria, for example, or in Vancouver more broadly, you end up getting the um, kind of the more underground scene and then the more, um, I guess, commercially viable scene start to kind of diverge, whereas in the 80s, they're more um, more closely aligned and it's a tighter community in that sense. So those splits end up occurring. Um, but I think that the type of narrative and the narrative that you do end up ultimately building, I think is uniquely... Um, uniquely crafted because of the the use of sources. I, when I'm doing my oral history interviews and I've interviewed um, 80, 100 people in, in certain communities, um, the narrative that I end up building almost always ends up kind of following the, the life stories of individual artists and it's kind of career driven. So we always talk about how they ended up getting um, kind of introduced to hip hop, where they ended up um, or I, how they got introduced to hip hop, just from a fan's perspective, how that ended up kind of evolving into them participating in it, the friends that they ended up building. Therefore, we can end up talking about the, the group projects and how those group projects ended up coming together. Um, the kind of releases that they ended up putting out, the, uh, reception of some of those releases, and then ultimately how they ended up kind of uh, steering away from the culture. And then with that, over a series of 80 to 100 interviews in these communities, you can kind of build a narrative of the community as a whole, kind of following these similar trajectories. Um, I don't end up ever coming across issues of race, for example, in in my interviews, because it's generally not something that the artists themselves really want to end up talking about. Um, at the very least, sure. something like in Halifax, where you're detailing that there's kind of racial tensions between certain uh, districts of the community, um, even if those were voiced at the time, I interviewed Joe Run, for example, and it's not like he's talking about those uh, those conflicts in the same sort of terms that he may have ended up talking about in, in 94 or 95. Um, so there's a different type of narrative that's being built, and I think that's, that's interesting in of itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I should speak to the race side of things because that, I felt, was something that was very much kind of put on the project. Um, I was looking to tell 
you know, a very plain story. I just wanted to tell a story about, you know, local artists and this incredible group of people who, you know, through their own hard work and independent spirit produced this scene that, you know, resulted in all this incredible work. Um, that was the story I wanted to tell, but of course it's an academic project. And so uh, my advisors said, you know, it has to have a, a theoretical lens. There has to be some uh, hook that you're hanging it on or some reason that we care. Uh, and race, I think, is something that people who are not intimately involved with hip hop uh, assume is a, a primary aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, so they're like, oh, you're studying hip hop. You must want to talk about race. Uh, And usually they mean kind of black and white, you know, they're not really concerned with any other constructions of race or any other, you know, racial considerations. And particularly in Nova Scotia, which does have a very long history of of racism and struggling with racism. uh, It it was not surprising that kind of my academic overseers were saying, this is the lens that you're going to have to use. Um, and I, you know, as a, a student with a, not a lot of power in that situation, just say, like, if it lets me tell the story, cool, I will do that. Sure. Um, and there were, there were elements of race, you know, uh, how Corey Bowles was treated or how Hip Club Groove was treated as a whole by other members of the scene. Uh, and there were, you know, there were times when race was a factor. I don't think race was the driving factor. I don't think it was maybe even something that anybody was actively thinking about at the time. Uh, So it's one of those things where like in hindsight, you can see that there is a racial component to this, or you can uh, describe this through a racial lens. And that's a way of doing it, which is why I was very careful when I wrote the title to say, this is a history of Halifax hip hop. It is not the history of, of Halifax hip hop. And that's something I totally stole from Jeff Gang because he did the same with Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Uh, but yeah, that was very much something that I think was was a bit of a narrative framework that was imposed on me for academic purposes. If I was completely free to do it differently, uh, I think I would have done something more along the lines of what you do and, and put in more oral stuff. But I think that would have also made it a much larger project. Um, and so sticking with the primary sources kind of narrowed the scope and made it a little bit more manageable for what it was going to be. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's tough because you do have to come up with, you know, a, a narrative. There has to be some through line and uh, you know, whether or not that ultimately is the most apt or the most realistic one, that's debatable. But uh yeah, I, I've always kind of thought about that. You know, the racial aspect of that thesis is, I think, valuable and viable, but also it could have gone in a different direction and not necessarily focused on that. I'm I'm happy that it did, but at the same time, I'm very aware that, you know, it the conversation could have shifted in a very different direction. Yeah, I think, obviously, that's kind of part of the nature of academic writing. Um, And I find that a lot. As I've been going through, like you, I've, um, in kind of structuring this thesis, the first thing I decided to do is let's just read as much of the the hip hop canon that's out there and try to absorb, yeah, you mentioned Trisha Rose, Mark Anthony Neal, Murray Foreman, um, all these kind of writers that are are well known within the field, and and let's read some of their text. And I, for one, I think their texts are very valuable. Um, I'm not going to take anything away from them. I enjoy reading them. I, I like a lot of the ideas that are discussed. I think they're interesting interesting and thought provoking. Um, and I think they're important to be kind of talked and analyzed and, and discussed. Um, that being said, I often end up feeling that academic writing within hip hop loses a sense of something that's very core to to hip hop, uh, which is kind of the community aspect of it. Um, if you're talking about um, if you're talking about specific kind of theoretical elements and you're, you're focusing your paper on a specific kind of idea or theme, um, let it be like bricolage or race or whatever your kind of, I don't know, your, your main kind of crux is for the article. Um, your 
looking for reasons why hip hop ends up supporting that idea rather than appreciating hip hop for for what it really is. And when I spoke to Mark, er, sorry, when I spoke to uh, Anthony Kwame Harrison, he ended up writing Hip Hop Underground, and I felt that that was one of the uh, kind of rare exceptions of an an academic piece that really ends up understanding the community itself and really kind of uh, puts the community in the forefront and understands how these kind of localized communities operate uh, rather than simply analyzing the lyrics of Public Enemy or um, looking at sales charts or any of that kind of, um, I don't know, any of those kind of sources. Um, And for the most part, even though your thesis ends up um, kind of, yeah, centering on this idea of race, it still addresses this kind of localized community and you really understand how that localized community sort of operates. Um, maybe I'm coming from it from a little bit of a different perspective in the fact that now rereading this for maybe the second or third time, I've had had some exposure to the Canadian hip hop scene more broadly, but also the, the Halifax scene. Um, I've, I've interviewed a lot of these people. I kind of understand where they're coming from, the, the community aspects to it. So maybe I'm, I'm reading into this more than it really is, but I did walk away from this feeling like, wow, this is another writer that's really kind of put the community first. And it feels like it's this localized kind of telling of how a community is structured. And you feel like it's a real community that exists within here rather than simply, um, again, looking at hip hop from a kind of an above kind of tertiary level. Um, but I, I've always kind of thought that that fault of hip hop in academia is largely due to the fact of how academia is structured. And like you said, forcing those ideas on you rather than just being able to, to freely talk about how you view a culture to exist. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the issues I'm dealing with now with the dissertation, uh, you know, you run into external examiners and, you know, people kind of outside your circle uh, who weigh in on what you're doing. And for me, the first question that they want me to address and, and seemingly the only question they want me to address is around whiteness. Um, you know, the, but you're a white guy and I conceive of hip hop as a black thing. So what's up with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and really kind of just this external perspective from people who don't know much about the scene, who, again, their own experience and understanding of hip hop and hip hop culture is fairly limited. Uh, and again, intimately tied to notions of race uh, and so that's the extent of where they can go. Uh, and I end up having to explain, well, look, you know, in this community, I've been working for 20 years. I've done X, Y, and Z. Uh, I've paid my dues in various ways. I'm still, you know, working on all of that. But at the same time, I've never had to explain my whiteness to anybody at a club where I'm playing or, Uh, a cypher that I jump into or a studio session that I sit in on Uh, people who are participating in it just want to be about the art and about the culture and about the music and and moving it forward. Um, We're not all sitting there, you know, dissecting each other's identity and trying to determine our validity and being there. Yeah. Uh, That's very something that outside perspectives impose. But then the other side of that is that, yeah, like this is a community I've worked with for a lot of years And I believe in this community. I care about this community. I know the people in it. Uh, The people I'm writing about are people I consider friends often. So, you know, I want to represent them well. I want to do right by them. And I think that we have this really incredible scene in Halifax. Uh, And I would extend that to kind of Atlantic Canada as a whole. We've got this incredible scene. We put an incredible amount of work. Most of it gets ignored. Um, and, and just kind of fades away over time, that deserves to be told. And the reality is that as hip hop is globalized, you know, I don't think there is a country in the world that does not have some form of hip hop going on. Yeah. Uh, China right now, like the Chinese government is using hip hop as an official propaganda tool to put out pro government messaging. Like it, there is no place in the world where hip hop isn't up and running. Um, that's very interesting to me. I think that also cuts through the idea that, uh, you know, hip hop is this, uh, racial construction specifically around blackness, certainly in its origins, 
certainly in its uh, North American mainstream expressions. Uh, certainly, yes, there are aspects of hip hop culture that have stayed black and, and rightfully so. But there's also hip hop in the Middle East and in Asia and in India and in, you know, South America and Africa and Europe and and everywhere. And it's not always an expression of the same politics that you would find here or the same identities that you would find here. And that's a good thing. So the local to me is this incredible microcosm of the global uh, by looking at how a scene like Halifax uses hip hop, how we adapt it to our own experiences and our own expressions and our own uh, unique identities here, that speaks to how other communities and other cultures do the same thing. So you can understand how hip hop works in New Zealand uh, or Beijing or Cape Town by looking at how hip hop works in Nova Scotia. Yeah. It's the same thing. You take the elements, you work with them, but you put your own culture, your own spin, your own identity on it, and then it serves you in a really kind of unique way. So I think that hip hop has become this very broad, global thing with a hyper localized focus as well. And there's still a lot of folks who are stuck thinking that the only important questions are about, uh, you know, 1973 in the Bronx. Uh, or, you know, how does it specifically speak to uh, American conceptions of blackness? Again, both great topics, important ones, but far from being the only questions that hip hop is tangling with now. And, and that's, I think, a problem is we, we need the academy. We need people outside of hip hop culture to start seeing it in this uh, more dynamic way. Yeah. Do you think that being forced to, I guess, include some of these components, these hot topic components, let it be race or gender or what have you, whatever the academy seems or, or views as valid um, or important at the period of time that you're, you're writing. Do you feel like including these ends up creating a misleading product? Or do you think, as you said earlier, it just ends up creating a history rather than the history? Um, and there's still, there's a place for it. It's just, we need to have multiple conversations. Yeah, I mean, I, there definitely is a place for it. I think it's important to talk about race and hip-hop. It's important to talk about blackness and hip-hop and sure. whiteness and hip-hop, gender and hip-hop. Those are all very important things. Uh, but yeah, I think we need to also realize that those are kind of singular avenues for investigation. Uh, there are lots of other things going on that don't have anything to do with that. And those are a lot of traditional uh, kind of tropes that, that academics investigate. So I get it. Um, but again, in a perfect world, I don't know that that would be as prominent a focus. Um, again, they should still be investigated, but I don't know that they would be as central. I think there's other aspects of culture and aspects of particularly the globalized culture of hip hop um, that, involve those things but also are completely capable of moving past them into other areas of investigation i want to talk about some of the specifics within the the thesis itself and then i want to talk about some of the the current work that you're doing as well um but sure. one of the most interesting elements that i've taken away from your thesis each time i read it is the idea of the mel branch tapes and how this kid um eric mel branch would travel to the states and then bring back these radio programmings from new york um or at least from the States, I, I believe from New York, but bring them back to Halifax and then introduce the community in Halifax. And this is during the kind of early to, to mid eighties and introduce the, the community to Halifax or of Halifax to New York hip hop. Um, and you kind of position it in a way that these tapes end up being hugely influential for a particular scene to be kind of crafted upon. Um, and the sounds and the styles that go along with, the New York hip hop sound that Mel Branch was bringing over um, really become identity statements of the, the Halifax scene up until a certain point until that division is made a little bit later into the kind of the mid nineties. Um, I find this stuff fascinating. It comes up in my research all the time. If this kind of um, this traveling expedition down to the States to bring back kind of artifacts into the the Canadian hip hop kind of repertoire, and then you start to end up getting influence from that. But what I find is most fascinating is in the case of this, 
you actually have a name to them, and seemingly you probably ended up finding some of these Melbranch tapes. Um, and the character of Eric Melbranch in that instance is kind of singled out as this really kind of important figure within the scene, whereas whenever I end up speaking to people in BC or Saskatoon or London, Ontario, the same story is often told, but you rarely end up end up getting um, an actual figure, um, a name of, per of somebody that actually ended up going down. You rarely get to see any of those tapes. Um, those are always kind of rumors that happened. Oh, I think somebody was bringing them into the schoolyard and then we would end up training, uh, trading those tapes, right? Because once they end up coming into the community, they get dubbed, they get spread out throughout the community very rapidly, and at least from my experience, you seem to always lose touch of who the original kind of carrier was. Um, and in this case, you, you don't. You, you have kind of figured out who some of these people were, at the very least, who one person was being Eric Melbranch. Um, I find this is a, a fascinating kind of topic throughout the, the book here, but I think it raises an interesting conversation about even the effects of, of cassette tapes and how kind of cassette tapes had an impact in the culture in these places. I just tweeted about a video uh, released recently anyway about the Columbia House mail-in program for CDs and tapes, ah. and that's a topic that gets talked about all the time, and it's kind of... It's interesting to see how these small, little, almost seemingly irrelevant details um, that exist within kind of Canadian culture or just ex that exist, period, um, and how much impact they end up having on these localized communities. Like, again, Eric Melbranch is, is really singled out in the thesis as being this important figure, like one of the most important figures outside of maybe Joe Run, um, as, like really influential in the scene um similar i would say in a way as like the columbia house stuff but these are without reading the thesis and kind of from being an outsider you would view these instances as completely irrelevant and not really worthy of discussing um i guess i i want to really talk about the the melbranch idea but can you I guess, how did you first end up hearing about Eric Melbranch, and how did you end up coming to, um, I guess, understand his impact in the community? So, yeah, Melbranch has become almost this mythological figure in, in my own work. Like, he's, you know, in the grand story, he's kind of Moses coming down from the mountain, like, you know, behold, look what I have brought you. Uh, and, and brings us stuff. You know, I, I have learned in, in subsequent years, you know, there were lots of people doing that. And, and Malbranch was by no means the only one doing it, but he was a notable person who did it. Um, and a lot of that is owed to Joe Run uh, in the stories that he would tell, you know, either in uh, journalistic articles or Hall of Famous posts, he would name him by name. Um, and he remembered the day, you know, they were going on a ski trip and he brought this box of tapes on the bus and everyone passed the tapes around to listen to. So, you know, it was this very firsthand experience where he knew exactly who the guy was. He knew where he had gone. Uh, and the tapes were so impactful that uh, Joe even remembered, you know, what was on each of the tapes. Uh, that was hugely important too, because when you talk to other people and they say, oh, I had this tape and it had these songs on it, you realize they're talking about the same thing. So it was kind of finding out about this idea and I just loved the story. I mean, people come to hip hop in different ways. Some people, yeah. you know, Vanilla Ice is the first bit of hip hop they ever hear. And that's unfortunate, but that's how it came to them. Sure. Uh, some people it's, you know, a music video or something, but the idea that there was this, you know, system where folks who had relatives down there were kind of taping stuff off the radio and bringing it back and then disseminating it. It was just such a neat story. And the fact that there was, you know, this specific guy in Eric Malbranch who kept getting named as the source for all this stuff. Uh, that just struck me as a fascinating part of the story. Uh, again, it's usually very amorphous. It's hard to tell where it comes from. Nobody remembers, you know, something comes into the scene, but you don't know who really brought it. In this case, there's a name. Uh, there's specific tapes 
uh, and people can tell you what was on them and, and how they went out there. And then to hear all these different people having ex- their own experiences of coming to those tapes and what that influence was. I just find that really, really interesting. Have um, you been able to locate either any of the tapes or Eric himself and be able to speak to him? I've never been able to speak to him. Uh, I'm sure if I could, he'd be super weirded out that you know, <laughs> kind of to this extent. And, you know, it's almost like that uh, Searching for Sugar Man documentary where it's like, I don't know if you knew, but you're famous in my thesis. Like, here we yeah. go. So I haven't, I, I heard some of the tapes. I think one of them got put up uh, onto YouTube a couple of years back. Um. And again, like really grimy, 10th generation, lots of tape hiss on it. Uh, but it was like a Mr. Magic show. And it's like, oh, that's, that's one of the tapes. So it was, and I think my experience with it was the same as a lot of people who got them uh, firsthand. It was like, wow, this sounds terrible, you know, in terms of the quality. But how cool is it that it's there and that you get it? And, uh, I was getting, you know, like the, the Columbia house thing, I think is a good, a good kind of, uh, analogy. There was another post not too long ago on Facebook about, uh, a record store in Halifax called soul to soul imports. Yep. Uh, and so many people jumped on it because I think for hip hop fans growing up in the city, we remember the importance of something like soul to soul. We had, uh, a and a records. We had Sam, the record man, we had, uh, you know, the various chains, but they couldn't, you know, they, their access to hip hop and, and the, the hip hop sections were always very small. <coughs> Excuse me. Soul to Soul was this place that sold incredible stuff that other stores didn't have. So uh, places where you can get things that you can't get otherwhere and otherwise in the city become hugely important. Yeah, I always find that it's it's either local radio programming, um, things like Columbia House have a huge, huge factor, um, and it, I don't know exactly, I haven't sat down with the data and, and really calculated anything, but um, I would estimate 60-70% of the people that I've spoken to that kind of grew up within that era had utilized the Columbia House kind of service. Um, and for those listening that aren't aware of Columbia House, it was essentially um, a mail-in program where you could end up ordering large um, kind of batches of CDs under often, well, it was such loosely orchestrated that you can end up using like fake names. I, I hear stories of people like signing up their cats to end up receiving uh, music, but you can end up ordering large amounts of music for like a penny um, or for a dollar. And um, you'd end up getting mailed to you a stack of CDs or tapes that were kind of hot new releases, um, and Columbia House would end up kind of structuring this deal so that you could, they would end up making money on the back end of things um, later down the road, and you would end up going in debt. But ultimately, it was kids that were signing up, and they didn't really care about kind of future consequences. And for the most part, they were able to get away with it because it was loosely structured. Um, but these, yeah, exactly like you're saying, Things like Columbia House or um, localized radio, um, and localized radio ends up being a big one, or kind of local uh, record shops that cater to hip hop, either um, exclusively, so things like um, Played a Record in Toronto or No Static in Saskatoon, um, or Phonographique in Saskatoon later on. Uh, fuck what you heard in in Vancouver, etc., or just yeah, or import kind of oriented stores. They they seem to drive the community, not only in terms of how they are introduced to the music, but also how the community itself is formed and the um, places that people can go in order to meet one another, build connections. And in terms of something like Columbia House, the story is enough in order to build relationships um, in terms of finding someone else that had done the same thing and then they're able to kind of bond together and meet and form some sort of group or relationship that will end up becoming important later down the career and whatever their career ends up being. Um, I think those are really important kind of aspects of the culture that often end up getting overlooked, um, especially things like college radio um, and community radio that it doesn't necessarily have the amount of weight to it as commercialized radio in most people's view. And most people will kind of dismiss college radio as not really even being a thing outside of maybe campuses. Um, 
but it has a huge impact when you look at subcultures like hip hop. Um, and I imagine the communities like punk rock, if I were to study punk rock, I would probably see the, the same sort of emphasis, um, put down on, on things like punk stores or, um, a college or community radio that, that offered, um, people an opportunity to, to build relationships and to access that music. Um, and I think your thesis ends up doing a good job at, at, kind of showing the importance of somebody like DJ Critical, who would later end up being Buck 65, and his importance of the the scene as well, and uh, what he was able to do in order to, to introduce people to music on kind of a wider scale um, from college campuses. Yeah, well, and that's what we had that I, I think a lot of places had something similar, but that's really what did it here. Um, I mean, I, yeah, my, my dog and my cat and my brother and my made up brother and my <laughs> other made up brother all had Columbia house accounts. You know? Uh, so it was pulling in a lot of stuff. And that was great. If you wanted like DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince albums or Gangstar or whatever. Sure. But one of the other things was, um, like Atlantic news, which was a, a magazine shop down in the South end. They carried word up, they carried rap pages and they carried the source. And it was the only place in the city where you could get them. So, you know, people who were interested would make their way down there and get copies of these things. Yeah. So you would read the You would watch Rap City on Much Music in, in the afternoons. Uh, and you would listen to CKDU and DJ Critical. Uh, so there were these kind of non-mainstream uh, avenues to, to acquiring some of this stuff or to learning about stuff. So, you know, I, as a suburban, you know, white kid growing up in Clayton Park, just on the outskirts of the city, I would go to Soul to Soul Imports in downtown Halifax looking for uh, Dred Scott or Pudgy the Fat Bastard or, you know, something that I'd read about or that uh, Rich had played on the radio or something that was in the source that wasn't going to be at Sam the Record Man. It wasn't going to be anywhere else. Yeah. But they have it in those places because those places knew who the they knew the good stuff. And, yeah, you would run into other people there. You would get to meet people. And, and, you know, it's in those kind of far flung corners where the more specialized stuff happens uh, that the people who are really into it start to meet each other and get to know each other and, and networks form. So, yeah, it's all, you know, just this fascinating web of how this stuff comes together uh, in the way that it does. Yeah, I want to I want to talk uh, and kind of transition the conversation towards some of the the current endeavors that you're you're currently working on, and I'm aware of two that are that are interesting at the very least in kind of relating to, to hip hop within academia at the very least, um, which are one the um, the archive that you are planning on building, which will encompass kind of Maritime's hip hop, and then second the um, the dissertation which you've interestingly been able to kind of turn into a, um, a hip hop record. And I want to be able to talk about kind of both of those, but to start with the, the archive, I find that really interesting. I just ended up having Mark Campbell on, um, for the podcast, but it will be two episodes prior to, to this one airing, or maybe the, the episode immediately before, um, and we ended up speaking about his North side hip hop archive and he kind of detailed yeah. it as a, as a yeah, as a rogue archive, um, separated from kind of your traditional government um, kind of ran archives. And um, he thought that that was kind of needed or required because your government structures have historically imposed um, certain rules and guidelines that have um, kind of, uh, that have, I guess, implemented a sort of ideology or in um, his argument would be racism within the the confines of what's covered in an archive. Um, so whenever you end up looking at material in an archive, it ends up having to go through this lens, um, which often doesn't really service the community. And in order to service the community properly, he felt that he ended up needing to, to start his own kind of rogue archive, which is um, community driven and um, kind of separate it from those I guess, traditional structures. Um, with the archive that you're building, from my understanding, it's it's within memory Nova Scotia. Um, and it's, I guess, following a, a more traditional path. Um, I wanted to talk about your 
your choice to even start this archive to begin with, and then the reason why you ended up choosing that kind of way, rather than, and this is something that I'm dealing with as well, because the the other alternative is simply to give your material to Mark Campbell, um, since he already has um, a Northside Hip Hop Archive, which is kind of structured to be this Canada-wide encompassing um, hip hop archive. Why not just give the material to him? Well, someday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would love to. I, I, I got to meet Mark once. I've been following what he's been doing with Northside for years, um, and I love it. And I, I'm going to steal a lot of his ideas because I think what he's doing is so fantastic. I'm, I think, you know, one of the issues around uh, Northside is kind of an unfortunate reality in dealing with kind of a pan-Canadian approach to hip-hop, which is that it tends to kind of default to a more Toronto-centric thing. Um, yep. That's often just because of the that's what's available, that's what's nearby, and there's so much there to work with um, that, you know, it just kind of happens that it coalesces around that. Um, I know the purview is bigger than that, and I'm sure, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, amazing by the time all is said and done. Um, but I would hope that there are people kind of looking out for other parts of the country as well, uh, Halifax or Saskatoon or Vancouver, uh, so that they can be as, uh, you know, deeply represented and, and as, as fulsome as, as Toronto's representation is. Um, again, that's not to take anything away from what, what he's doing because it's such an incredible project. Um, sure, sure. But yeah, I kind of decided... Uh, it, it really came up after the dissertation or sorry, after the thesis ended uh, and trying to think about what was next, thinking about ideas for a, a doctoral dissertation, what I might do uh, and what field I might even do that in. And what it came down to was this realization that on the strength of having been a fan for a lot of years, uh, having been a, a practitioner for a lot of years uh, and as, a historian who started actively trying to gather raw materials and primary sources that led me to kind of continue doing that just out of habit, even after the thesis ended. So at some point I'm looking at this stuff and I think it was, you know, a standard issue Facebook arguments uh, between a couple of local rap fans trying to decide who had the biggest local hip hop collection. Um, and they were throwing out some really small numbers in terms of what they had. And I'm looking over at my shelves just like, wow, that's, you know, not even close. Um, you know, these guys talking about big collections, mine's 15 times what they've got. Yeah. Um, they're sitting here. So I thought, I've got all this stuff. More so than that, a lot of it is so ephemeral. Oh. Uh, it just, it can go away. Uh, you're often talking about independent projects. Uh, so the CDs or records or, or whatever physical media themselves, those often get pressed up in, you know, 100, 200, 500 maybe at most uh, in a run. Yeah. After a couple of years, people lose them and, and even the artists don't have them and, and you lose the brick and mortar stores. So access to them goes away. So I'm like, this stuff disappears. And I've got stuff in my collection that you just, you couldn't find it in the world if you wanted to. I mean, this isn't Michael Jackson's off the wall. You can't, you know, just go into any shop and ask for it. Nobody's even heard of some of this stuff. Yeah. And that kind of broke my heart. I'm like, I don't like the idea that people who work on this, and again, it's all so independent, uh, putting their, you know, blood, sweat and tears into something. And then after a few years, they move on and, and it just kind of gets forgotten. That's, that's tragic. There's so much work that's gone on. Uh, posters and, and flyers for shows are even more fleeting because, uh, you know, people rip them down or they get postered over or the rain takes them out. So this stuff is, you know, representative of a vast amount of really incredible work. And at the same time, it disappears incredibly quickly. So I thought somebody has got to start uh, consciously archiving some of this stuff. A lot of people had archives. Joe Run's got a great collection of stuff. Uh, I know 6-2 kind of famously has a closet full of 6-2 material up in Montreal. Uh, I know Jesse Dangerously's got a, 
you know, a giant bin in his parents' garage or something that has all this stuff. But again, that's not accessible and it's not publicly available. And if something were to happen to any of these folks, I mean, that stuff could end up in a landfill. Yeah. So, you know, it was about preservation. And again, here's the scene that I love and I think is so important. Um, I wanted to preserve it. So I started just collecting it and then it got to the point of thinking, okay, how do I formalize this collection? It's, it's one thing to have it all on a shelf and in a drawer, but I'm going to have to catalog this stuff. So I started reading into digital humanities and, you know, how archiving works, figuring out how some folks do it and how other folks do it. And, and, you know, based on what I'm trying to do, how can I do it? So you have to set up some rules for what gets in and what doesn't and what you're going to cover and what you're not. Uh, And I try to be as inclusive as I can. Um, because I think to agree with what Mark says, yeah, there is a lot of institutional stuff about how archives are run, just as there is institutional stuff about how academies want you to write about stuff that doesn't always represent it well. So I'm going to do it in my own way where I can write the rules. I can decide who gets in and who doesn't based on the most inclusive model that I can come up with. And I can use the knowledge I have to, you know, go after certain stuff or try to represent stuff and uh, and seek things out. I mean, a really good example of, of kind of bending the rules is Shy Love. She's an incredible artist from here, now based in Toronto, uh, won an ECMA, put out a lot of videos, uh, appeared on the 44 North compilation, uh, you know, a, a fairly well-known figure. Hasn't put out any albums of her own. So, you know, I've got a couple of mixtapes in my archive from Toronto because they feature a Shy Love song or two, Um, you know, and are they purely Nova Scotian? No, but I'm putting them there because I want Shy Love to be represented in this archive. Uh, And if that's how I'm going to do it, then I'll pull that in and use that. And then, of course, as I was doing all of this stuff, uh, the purview expanded as well. It started out with mostly Nova Scotian stuff, but nothing in the Maritimes is purely in one place because somebody from Nova Scotia works with uh, some people in New Brunswick. You know, you've got uh, First Words and you've got Joe Run kind of going up there to do that. So I'm like, well, then I should include New Brunswick stuff. And then if I'm going to do that, I might as well include PEI and then started looking into Newfoundland stuff. And I'm like, well, why don't I just call this kind of an Atlantic Canadian archive? Um, So that's what I did. I I called it East of East, uh, which is kind of a joke based on the idea that Canadian tours always go out east and they end at Montreal. Yep. So I feel like we're kind of east of east as far as Canada goes. Um, but yeah, there's so much stuff that's come out of here. The albums alone that I have uh, documented, there's, I think, close to 1,800 of them. Yeah, which so is crazy. From a 30-year period in a place where you know, your average person would not think was a hot spot for hip hop culture. That's an incredible amount of work. Like I, I love getting people to guess, you know, when I tell them that I run this archive of Atlantic Canadian hip hop recordings, how many records do you think I have in it? And people will say, I don't know, 30, 50, how many rap records could have come out of the Maritimes? Yeah. And when yeah. I think, you know, I've like almost 1800, the jaws hit the floor. Like, how is it that there's so much stuff there that people don't know about? And that's exactly why I want to do it because there's so much stuff here that people don't know about. Yeah. I feel like you really hit the nail on the head. Like whenever I work on this project, I'm also accumulating a a fair amount of um, a physical collection, but also in terms of just digital material that is contributed to the project that is otherwise very hard to to get your hands on, right? Um, it's not even just in terms of recordings, but as you said, the the flyers, the visual material, um, those things have been scanned in and sent my way. And oftentimes they're they're like gold mines of information that is just completely inaccessible otherwise. And I feel like there's there's two aspects and you address both of them, but one of them is servicing the community. So as you said, People ended up putting their blood, sweat, and tears into these projects, and you want them to be able to um, kind of have a long life and 
be remembered in some sort of way. And then the other aspect of it is you need it to be accessible, not only to service that community, but also to serve the research community that's hopefully going to come along after us and continue to end up working on these stories that are not being discussed by us. Because, of course, we can't cover everything. So um, there should be we should make it the material accessible as much as possible so that those stories can still be talked about and um, they can have an easier time in telling that story. Um, I, I think of the same things myself often, and it's always a question of where do I want this material to go? Um, clearly, there clearly it should not just stay within my, my house. Um, I think that's probably not where it should end up. Um, if, the more you end up reading about archival practices and racism and issues kind of involving um, archives and the, the kind of negatives of, of government-ran archives, it sways you away from um, kind of including it in there. Not only that, but it ends up being kind of an academic audience that has access to these things in most cases. Um, before I joined university, and I, I took about 10 years off after high school to, to start university, and within that period of time, I was a big fan of, of hip-hop, and I never once visited an archive to, to learn about hip-hop. Um, archives were just something that were was inaccessible to the general community, even though they try not to be, and I've worked at an archive as of now, and I know that they're friendly to the community itself. Um, to the community, they're often... Um, there's often kind of a wall separating them and it doesn't feel accessible. Um, so you run into that problem. So do I want to end up posting the material just online and scanning everything in myself and creating some sort of digital archive? And that seems great. But at the same time, the, it's not as permanent as something like a government ran archive that has weight to it and that's been around for centuries or not centuries but for decades at the very least and it feels permanent if i donate something to the local archive here at the beaten institute i feel like it's going to be represented well and i feel like it's going to end up being held here uh, for a very long time and if anything does end up happening to the beaten they'll be able to appropriately place it to the next place where it should be kind of preserved um and i feel like they'll be able to to do that good job and that's their business of doing so um and i feel like if i were to to publish something online myself what happens if um i pass away and i stop paying for the domain um or whatever it ends up being and that exactly. material becomes inaccessible that those are fears that i have and that conversation of what to do with the material do you just do kind of a mixture of everything and just try to get it in as many places as possible that i feel like ends up usually being where i kind of side with the matter um but it's an interesting conversation to be had because yeah you're dealing with these relics that are that are kind of dissipating right it, they're not only being lost but the recordings themselves are just being damaged um they're they're not being preserved in the best manner that they should be preserved in and i know myself i i don't have the ability in order to um i don't know to monitor the humidity in my room in order to to preserve these long term i don't have i don't have all of the 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 I guess, technology that exists in an archive, a formal archive, in order to, to best kind of suit the material that they have. Um, it's, it's a real challenge, but it's going to end up being lost if, if we don't do something about it. Well, and that's why I think it's important to kind of do this work now. Um, that's why I'm doing this now. That's why I think Mark is doing North Side stuff. Um, I mean, it's... I don't want to be so ghoulish as to go to people and say, listen, write me into your will so that if anything happens to you, your hip hop materials come my way, you know, sure, but you want I, to. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, only want to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it, we are starting to see a shift. I mean, uh, Harvard University now has a hip hop archive. Um, you know, they offer fellowships. You can go and work there as an academic. You can, you know, do interesting things. Um, very much focused on kind of mainstream expressions. And I, I would love to go work with them on kind of a more uh, looking at local scenes tip. Um, but the idea that there is something at Harvard University that is a proper hip hop archive seeking to document uh, the history of the culture. Um, there's also the Smithsonian's uh, relatively new, the African-American Experience Museum. Uh, that has some hip hop stuff to it. Yep. And there is the... Uh, 
there, there are a few kind of institutional hip hop museum archive things starting to happen, at least in the States. I would love to see that happen in Canada as well. I imagine, you know, sometime in the future, uh, you know, all of us independent archivists coming together and saying, you know, let's, let's build a museum with a, a digital repository that's searchable, but also some physical space to, to house and, and show this stuff so people can go in and hip hop such a, a visceral tactile thing. You know, you want to go lay your hand on the record. You want to, you know, jump in the cypher. You want to experience it in a real way and flip through the, the albums and stuff. So, you know, I think in the future, there's definitely something for that. Yeah. And uh, for now, yeah, I think that's what it's about for mine. It's been uh, like, I haven't been able to focus on it enough uh, to date where I can really get it out and, and blow it up. Uh, so right now it's, it's really kind of a solitary effort, but what I hope to do once I'm able to, uh, get a searchable website built, which is something I've been working on for quite some time. Um, once I'm able to start, you know, formalizing this thing and getting it out there, uh, I want to do things like what Mark Campbell has done with his digitizing sessions you know, reach out to the community and say, okay, here's what we have. It's got gaps in it. If you recognize a gap and you've got something, bring it along. We'll, we'll digitize it. We'll add it to the collection. We'll, you know, you'll keep it, but we'll make a record of it. And, you know, I, I want that to be the case. I want it to be something that is community built rather than something that is just, you know, me, the independent hip hop nerd finding this stuff and, you know, building it all on my own. I think it really needs to be a community thing that turns it into something quite spectacular. Uh, and then, yeah, hopefully at some point in the future, either, uh, you know, a Canadian hip hop museum or archive, uh, or everything together. Yeah. Or, I mean, if not, uh, if I wind up at a university, I, I hope to make the archive the, the center uh, of my research program moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of other aspects of hip hop in the Atlantic provinces. I haven't even gone anywhere near. Uh, so I would love to do that too. But that's, that's it as well. Like I, I'd be willing to kind of place my physical collection in, in some place uh, where it's accessible. But yeah, again, you know, is it just accessible to uh, researchers or is it accessible to the public? I really would like to see it be both. Um, so yeah, it's a tough question, but I think in, in the meantime, it's just about, keep gathering the materials, keep doing the stuff. Um, because by the time it does get kind of formalized, uh, you know, it's going to be too hard to go back and, and find that stuff after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in total agreement. And I, I also agree that I, I think it needs to end up being community based in terms of having, um, having the ability for the community to directly um, donate to that project in, in their own way, um, it just being it, centering the the collection to just being one person's collection ends up by nature um, excluding a large portion of the material that people are just not it's, willing to give up. Um, it's terrible, yeah. And that's yeah. really been the problem with documenting Halifax hip hop history. The most contentious articles, the most contentious you know reviews or documentaries. They're always a singular perspective where somebody has said, here's the choices I've made and this is what I'm going to focus on, which is a completely legitimate thing to do when you're writing a project. You know, you have to give it structure, but that invariably becomes a singular perspective and it leaves people out. So something like an archive, I think, has the potential to cut through that singularity uh, and really be about community representation. It's not just me telling a story. It's me facilitating the, the community kind of saying, here's who we are, uh, you know, in a grand way. And, and that's not something I can do on my own. So I do need uh, the community support. And I do need, you know, people to, to want to support this thing and, and help build it out. It only gets good if we put as much into it as we can. So, yeah, yeah. if there's gaps let's work together to fill them or who do you know who could fill it? Or do you have an uncle somewhere with a box in their closet that might be able to, you know, answer this question for us? So that kind of thing I think is crucial. Yeah. I think it's really important. And I, I don't know, I see myself, 
uh, kind of long term, I think in a similar way as, as you, is I want to I want to continue throughout my life to to work on this project of of documenting Canadian rap um, in hip hop culture more broadly. I think it's really important. Um, I think one of the the aspects that I realized fairly early on in my project was um, the the actual content that we have here and not just in terms of albums that are being produced, but the culture that existed here at one point in time and the culture that still exists today, I think is actually valuable information. I don't think it's only valuable from the perspective of a hip hop fan. Um, I think it's actually a, an important part of Canadian history and I think it needs to end up being documented if we want to be truthful about what Canadian art history really meant or what Canadian history meant more broadly. Um, I, I didn't understand the, the scope of it, and I think by you saying the, the 1800 albums in, um, or records within, within the Maritimes alone, I, I think illustrates just the, the scope of, of what kind of material we're talking about. Like it's, it's large and massive and connected, and it's a community that's connected from a very early time. I, I've talked to people in Halifax that, that knew people in Vancouver on a first name basis in the mid nineties before the internet, just from hip hop alone. Um, that's fascinating to me. Like our country's huge. Um, yeah, I, I don't know people from, from Vancouver unless I went out there and I wouldn't know them only because of hip hop music. Um, that's, that, that's incredible. I guess I, I've now, that's happened, but due to the internet and my connections and my my actual effort in doing so, but this community is 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 really important. And as of recent, well, up until recently, there really hasn't ended up been any sort of real effort to to document this in in any real kind of all encompassing way. And I'm glad that there's people like you or Mark Campbell or myself that are that are going and, and putting in the effort to to either tell the story in terms of an individual scene or um, as the country as a whole or doing any of their any of the kind of small pieces of the puzzle that are needed in order to to make the the bigger picture complete. Um, and yeah. I'm glad that that's that's being done. And I'm like, I don't know, I see myself dedicating the majority of my life to, to working on this project. Um, that archive sounds fascinating. And yeah, that's exactly what I want to end up doing as well. When you mentioned the internet, and I think that's such a, it's such a crucial part of all this too, because, you know, the, the internet largely defines the, the boundaries of the archive that I'm working with, because I'm trying to preserve stuff from a time before the internet really fundamentally changed everything. As you said, you know, there was a time in the 90s, people were, you know, had this cross Canadian connection before there was social media, which is fascinating. And I think that's important too, because once you add the internet, some of the barriers to involvement come down, which is arguably a good thing. But in terms of determining who is making tangible contributions to the scene versus who you know makes records in their basement but never leaves and doesn't go perform and doesn't tour and doesn't do anything else or uh some little crew that you know they've got video making equipment and they're pretty talented with it so they crank out a lot of videos but they don't ever make records and they don't play shows and like the internet has made it harder to determine who is making a tangible contribution while making it easier for people to just participate so there's so many questions about that, but yeah, all the, the pre-internet stuff uh, and early internet stuff, I think it just has to be saved or else it goes away. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I want to talk about before we end up kind of leaving this conversation, um, the, the current project that you're working on in terms of the record and your dissertation. Um, I, I don't know how much you can actually talk about that publicly as of yet, because I know it's not published, um, but can you kind of detail for those listening what exactly the, the project is? So I'm doing a doctorate in educational studies. Um, and again, I was looking at how do I use hip hop here? How do I talk about hip hop? Um, so I spent a lot of time reading up into to hip hop education, uh, various, you know, forms of hip hop pedagogy, uh, you know, Chris Emden, uh, Mark Lamont Hill, Emery Pechauer, just, you know, anything I can soak up in terms of how people are using it in an educational capacity. And so I started pitching various ideas and, you know, how it goes with a dissertation type thing. You, you have one idea and then it morphs into 12 other things before you nail it down. Um, 
so ultimately it came down to the idea that I've been engaging in hip hop pedagogy in various forms here on the East coast of Canada for almost 20 years. Um, starting out with workshops, starting out with, with uh, seminars and, and lectures and talks and things, and then moving into uh, writing a, a historical thesis and starting to archive things. Um, but also in how I teach my own courses at Mount St. Vincent, uh, some courses are actually rooted in hip hop specifically, others just in music, but I'm able to use hip hop, uh, hip hop elements and the philosophies that drive hip hop culture to inform, you know, pedagogical strategies, but also assignments and how I have students approach the work that I want them to approach. So taking all of these things that I've done over the years, I'm trying to now put that together into something that could be a bit of a roadmap for other educators who want to incorporate hip hop, uh, who want to learn how to do that in an effective way, not so much the, the rapping teacher, but somebody who, you know, developing uh, a, a crop of teachers who understand something about hip hop culture and can connect with their students uh, and use uh, the tools of hip hop as an educational you know, vehicle. I'm not saying it's the only way to achieve uh, you know, things like uh, culturally responsive pedagogy, but it's a good way of doing that. Uh, so I'm currently, well, I'm making a rap record <laughs> that kind of track for track uh, represents an autoethnographic uh, deconstruction of my own efforts over the years as I try and figure out, you know, what are the essential elements here? What is the root of my own hip hop pedagogy? What are the lessons that can be taken away from that and applied to others? Uh, so again, it's, it's a little bit uh, autobiographical, but it's also about, you know, 20 years of trying to be about hip hop and education in this province and how successful has that been or not? <laughs> One of the things that you ended up mentioning earlier is the the importance to make it a good rap record, um, and I, I find that interesting mainly because although I I agree and I um, encourage people to to use hip hop within kind of edu- like for educational purposes anyhow, um, oftentimes the product of that ends up being kind of cringeworthy and it seems disconnected from what hip hop actually is, um, which is uh, there's there's levels of authenticity that kind of come with hip hop and it's usually fairly easy to distinguish what is authentic and what's not authentic for someone that's within the culture. Um, and generally these educationally kind of platformed performances of, of hip hop culture generally end up crossing the line into not being authentic. Um, and it's yeah. easily recognizable to not be authentic. Um, can you speak on that? And I guess as a follow up to that, how different is this record going to be than your typical hip hop record? Is it going to feel like a typical hip hop record or is it going to be noticeably different? Well, I really want it to feel like a hip hop record because you're right. There is kind of a sharp divide between, you know, authentic hip hop culture and people who, you know, whatever their intentions are trying real hard, but it just doesn't land. Um, and I see that a lot in, in studying hip hop pedagogy too. There are uh, people who are, I mean, anybody who kind of gets into hip hop education, I think comes from a, a deep love of hip hop. They're, they're either a practitioner or uh, a super fan, uh, you know, or are involved in some aspect of the culture. I, I don't know that there are a lot of people doing, you know, intense hip hop education who don't have some connection, but there are sure. a lot. And there are teachers who want to incorporate this stuff, but they don't know how, and, or they don't know how to do it without it being embarrassing. Um, and so from my end, and especially looking at a lot of, uh, you know, ethnographic research into to hip hop education, it's often somebody who is an academic or a researcher looking in on somebody who is a practitioner uh, and trying to guess what their me- uh, motivations are or try to guess why they made the choices they made. So I wanted to bridge that gap for one. The idea that I could be both the researcher and the practitioner was interesting to me. 
Um, I can speak to my own motivations for why did I pick this sample or why did I write this line the way I wrote it. But also, you know, after being around for a lot of years and I've, I've made a lot of rap records, I I would not want to make something that wasn't at least half decent to listen to. Yeah, um, of course. It, the idea, I mean, you could you can make kind of educational rap, but it always ends up being like, well, my name is Mike and I'm here to say, you know, <laughs> and like, no, that's sit down. Um, so that's part of the goal here is that, you know, I, I need it to kind of speak to the the content but I'm also going to do it in the way that I would normally do a rap record. You know, things are going to be wrapped up in metaphor. I'm going to use uh, literary methods to, you know, not necessarily obscure what I'm trying to say, but style on it a little bit, you know, make it poetry um, and try to make it good. So I, I've got to make the beats myself. I've got to make, you know, I've got to write the rhymes. I've got to engineer the thing. i got to, you know, mix it. So there's all these steps I've got to take where I'm involved. And I, I, one, don't want to fall on my face and embarrass myself. <laughs> Two, I want to represent the culture as best I can and not make something that's embarrassing. Uh, and three, like if you're going to make something that's musical, if you're going to make an album, then make it good, damn it. <laughs> I think of uh, A.D. Carson. I don't know if you've ever come across him. He made the news a couple years back. He did... Uh, I think he did a dissertation as an album uh, and it was, it was okay. It was pretty good. And then I think oh, wow. just this year he released the first peer reviewed rap album. Um, so it's like, it's got footnotes, but he sent it around to other academics to like proof his work before it came out. So he's doing stuff that's interesting and it, it works as a rap record. It sounds good, but it also has those academic bona fides. And I kind of like that as a challenge. Like, okay, I see what you're doing. I'm going to try and do something similar. Um, it will, of course, be very different and be my own thing, but, you know, I, I can't make a whack record. I mean, how's that going to look? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so is there going to be any written component to the, the dissertation, or is yeah, that so something you're still working out? Or No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of keeping, like, a journal as I go, so – there's kind of a beat journal that explains my thought process and searching for samples and why am I gotcha. using this or that. And then I also do a bit of a written breakdown. Uh, it's mostly just kind of my own process of note taking, um, but it ends up being kind of a, a written component, very much not in a traditional sense. It's, it's kind of an ergodic, uh, multiple narratives on the page, lots of little asides and, and stuff. Um, but that's kind of my note taking process. If I'm going to write a song, I, you know, sit down and say, okay, what is this going to be about? So I write out, here's where my thinking is. Here's the relevant information and me kind of introducing that. And then once I have that, I sit down and write the rhymes. So that'll, that'll be kind of the, the written component of it will be all of those notes with the lyrics fully annotated. Um, so it'll be kind of this almost chaotic document that goes with it but the other thing we're trying to figure out now is uh we're in communication with the library at the school saying you know what do you need in terms of something archivable do you do you need something physical could it be a website can it just be a recording does it have to be you know bound into a book uh nobody at my school anyway has ever had to tangle with that kind of question so um we're figuring that part out and uh, the final form will be decided, I guess, based on uh, what the requirements, you know, for the actual archiving of a finished project are. That's really interesting. I, um, I encourage you to, to use the, the written portion of it and include that as the liner notes for the album. If you, if you do end up pressing anything physical. Oh, that's the plan. Yeah. I want, I imagined like those old 1990s, oh God, even going back to Columbia House, but the old, uh, the box sets, you know, yeah. you get the same box set and it's got a, like a book bound into it and then it's got a couple of CDs and, you know, a I don't know. Criterion how box set for an album. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'll come up with some kind of interesting packaging that, that binds it all together. And that, I think that's part of it too, is, you know, uh, I've always been a very DIY indie kind of artist. So, 
like I'm going to bring that straight to the academy and say, you know, here it is. That's this is what it is. Perfect. Um, again, man, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out to speak to me here today. I appreciate it. I'd love to have another one of these conversations down the road. Um, there's lots more to talk about, even in terms of the thesis. I wrote plenty of notes and we got to maybe about half of them. Um, so there's still lots to talk about. In addition to that, once you end up putting out new material, let it be the, the archive becomes more formalized and out there or the record ends up coming out. I would love to dissect that and, and talk to you because that sounds like a really interesting project alone. Um, I'm sure there's there's going to be opportunities for us to speak again in the future. And then, of course, um, I, I think we, we talk on and off regarding uh, both of our mutual projects, and I think they go hand in hand. So, um, again, thank you for taking the time out to speak to me, and I would love to have you back on again. Anytime. Absolutely. Anytime. I love talking to all of my Canadian hip-hop academic <laughs> people. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. You have yourself a wonderful day, Michael. Awesome, man. Thanks for chatting. Peace. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.